They do say time flies when you're having fun because TT120 scale is back on the UK market after almost 60 years. Well, 12 months on, having modelled double O and TT120. Has it been worth it? Which would I go with now? And as the HM7000 system with Bluetooth decoders reaches its first anniversary on the 10th of this month, is this the way to control my locus and points, signals and accessories in the future? P.S. Stick around because there's one place we need to go to find out one important question that you might need to ask. And it could happen at any point in the show. So don't miss it. <laughs> Cause you're gonna hear A brand new story about a great engineer He's the greatest of them all we claim Number one is his engine Casey Jones, his name Casey Jones, steaming and rolling Casey Jones, you never have to guess When you hear a tooting of the whistle It's a Casey at the throttle of the Cannonball Express Hi, my name's Andy and this is my channel Model Loco for all things Model Railway Please give us a thumbs up and subscribe. It won't hurt the bank balance. There's a five and a half inch hole drilled through this wall. So when TT120 was announced, it was going to have to be something special for me to take the plunge. And take the plunge I did. Let's look at the pros and cons and send this one back down as we wait with bated breath to find out what Hornby has in store for us all this year. And I do believe it's the only twin track design anywhere. <laughs> Perfect timing. I'm just giving you a bit of a running shot in Shiredale up here, which was formerly known as the Mac Cave. I'm just gonna bring the class away in first. Look, I've got the sound on so you can hear them. Bringing the Flying Scotsman in. Finally, there we are, the Mallard. They look wonderful. Here is a double O gauge model. Side by side, you can really start to see the size difference. Some people say, oh, it's not worth looking at, but for me, what has hindsight uncovered along the way? What are the strengths and the weaknesses I've found? Is the honeymoon over for one? Have I been wound up unnecessarily? Or am I still as happy as a talking station clock pendulum with both? Ah, well, you may ask. If that proves to be the case, pray tell. Which would I advise myself to get if I could only pick one, knowing what I know now? <sighs> Let's dig in. So number one, no front couplings on steam trains at present from Hornby, probably due to the light front pony truck assembly. But no doubt this will change when we see some steam 060 designs like the class 08, for instance. Number two, looking at the couplings themselves. If I now remove the double O, they're using these more Tilly based couplings. Now I like these, I do. I like them, um, but only know of one coupling ramp that's available at present over here with this. I've incorporated one, two, and I'm going to put another one in the main station just in case. Now, they only fit Hornby track because Hornby have made these ramps, but you can get around it. And I have by cutting a small piece and then letting it in between the Pico and it does fit OK. You've got to use, I would say, Hornby uh, track joiners because they're just slightly wider than the Pico ones which are made really for end gauge track but we've looked at that in a previous episode and I've, I'll put the link on the screen now on video ML or whatever it was. My encounter with shunting so far has been very encouraging indeed and it seems to do the job for shunting if fitted correctly into the Hornby track and left ballast and particle free, of course, without cuts for anything, but it's even more so as you scale down. These can also be hooked up to point motors, as I've done. End scale, I think, is a bit too light for shunting yards. TT120, I found it okay so far, but double O, you've got everything under the sun for that. Number three, 
Flexible Pico track is harder to lay due to the rail extrusion design, as we've said on the Pico design, can cause more of a learning curve to get bends running smooth because they're using end scale fish plates. So they are actually smaller. So if you're trying to curve your track, you're gonna sprain them very easily. But again, we've looked at that and laying track so you can follow the link as well. If you're not sure, they are less effective in that regard than their double O gauge Pico counterparts. Number four, lack of more varied points from Pico at present, i.e. curved and double slips. Number five, surface mounted point motors do look cumbersome unless hidden. And I've hidden them under my roadway and under my platforms because point motors are double O size. Well, they still look cumbersome on a double O layout. Number six, the TT120 Class 08, as I've described in another video, in its present form cannot accommodate the new HM7000 Bluetooth sound decoders. Okay, so there's no speaker fitted at all in these locos. Number seven, lack of UK manufacturers on board at the present time, but of course, Pico and Hornby have both gone in. Number eight, painted figures are hard to get hold of in the UK. They are. Um, some 3D printed figures are not always to scale. So beware of this or keep them apart on layouts and then they'll look all right. But I've got a few through and the engine drivers look nice in the cabs, but they are a bit small. They're smaller than the others, you know, so they look like. Number 10, if you're looking for steam generators, which are coming out, this summer, then they're not planned for this scale because they're just, it's just physically too small to get these steam generators in. So if you want steam generators and puffing smoke coming out of your chimney stacks, then go to below. Number 11, there's a slight insecurity over the next phases and new products coming out to market. We're not sure, well, me personally as a consumer, since Simon Kohler left and Hannah Montana, of course, and then others, what the plans are and I've seen no real new models coming through as yet. I'm hoping that's going to change very early in January. Just some coaches or some fresh buildings, not just more stuff coming back in stock that went out of stock. Number 12, lack of static vehicles and resin buildings. So come on, we get some new buildings back out. So if you're looking for moving vehicles on your TT120 layout, I've seen one end scale, one from Foller. There's nothing from Weissman at all. Unless you go the way I did. And I wanted, I didn't want cars. And because it's more of a country road that I've got, but I've got white lines down it. So it's just between, you know, I've got moving motorbikes, as you can see. And I've done that with Magnarel. I think Magnarel should um, supply their own road surfacing because people struggle to find a good surface to run these vehicles on, even the bikes and the magnets are just the right strength. If you try to increase it too much, it just sticks. Would it pull the moving vehicles on the road surface I use, which was from Knock? No, it's too rubbery. It was touch and go. The motorbikes are good though, and they look fabulous. I'm really happy with them. If you want follow moving vehicles that stop traffic lights and a good collection, that's double O again. Number 13, I'm looking for some. Dual app and hands on devices are supported with the HM7000 decoders. So this is great. I mean, which leads us to number 14, where there's no programming track necessary with the HM7000 app, which is free, and the Bluetooth decoders if they're fitted in your locomotives. Brilliant. Number 15, it leads us on again. The CV settings can be instantly and easily altered. I love that. I still like my hands on, but I am getting more used to the app and it is very easy just to turn your Bluetooth on on your iPad or your iPhone, make sure it's compatible or Android device, but the compatibility charts are on the Hornby site. They're updated all the time. You can then alter volumes and CV settings instantly. There's no more messing about and like hours of going through menus. Oh, will I be controlling my whole layout with a HM7000 app? That's a great question. Because we get the train set, don't we? Then we want to control accessories. And the app features the ability to do this. But how do we do that? The answer, I'll try to keep as simple as possible. And we will have to see what is unveiled on the 9th from Hornby with the 2024 
releases. But DCC controllers control accessories like locos by sending information packets down the track to specific decoders and accessory units that react to this information whilst leaving other decoders and locos unaffected. With DC controllers, whatever is on the track gets the same signal. Now we have the HMDCC Bluetooth decoders that can get this specific DCC information via the track or via built on wireless Bluetooth antenna which is where the HM7000 app comes in. But this can only operate trains and accessories that have Bluetooth connectivity at present. And I say this because if Hobby finally released the Bluetooth legacy dongle that fits into standard hands-on DCC controllers like the Hornby Elite or Select, etc., which are controllers that incorporate the express net sockets on the back of them, then the app, they claim, will then be able to piggyback onto this and control non-Bluetooth DCC items connected to them, like DCC equipped locos and accessory decoders we've used in the past. On top of this, the HMDC app, which controls DC layouts through a Bluetooth equipped transformer unit, has had an accessory control unit for quite some time now that you can buy as an add-on. And you've got to use impulse point motors. It's no use trying to use other point motors that have a slow throw. So you could get the R7293, which is the HM6010 base controller um, for accessories. And you might need to get the power transformer, which Hornby supply as well. There's one with a lower amp output, which is cheaper, which won't control as many units, but you could check Holmes' website, see how many you can control. I'd say it's about two. And if you need more than two units to power these, then you can get a bigger transformer unit, which is a lot more money. And this all adds up. Failing that, if you've the old original non-Bluetooth accessory DCC decoders like me, you know, that Holmes used to make and other people, then you can wait for the legacy dongle to finally drop. Let's hope it's January the 9th. But that being said, it's not the whole story because once we get the train set and we start controlling the accessories, we think, hmm, I wonder if my computer could control some of the more mundane tasks for me. And at this point, it's where I got my fingers burnt with Hornby, to be honest, in the past. It has to be noted too, that Hornby, in my experience, seem to do things their own way as with going into double O size scale instead of HO. Due, it was claimed to UK locos when scaled down, having less room to accommodate the motors available in the past. That said, it was also one way of securing you kept buying that scale and that size that sits, of course, on HO track to this day. So in that effect, it's out of scale by about 2.5 millimetres when we're looking at gauge, but I digress. Hornby also adopted with uh, the Elite and the Select Controllers the ExpressNet connection over LocoNet to control DCC information being sent to decoders. And this avoided them paying fees, I guess, to that developer who invented LocoNet. And Hornby did promise block detection years ago, then dropped the idea Sadly, after I bought into it by buying the Elite and the Selects, hoping that one day I could go on to computer control, Railmaster never really ever lived up to that, and block detection never came to fruition. So I did get my fingers burnt. So if you're like me, you'll eventually want computer control of some description, which requires detection of some kind. And yes, Hornby are again muttering that the HM7000 app may well offer this in future. And I suspect this will be done, of course, by utilising the Bluetooth antennas and wireless signals um, being sent from device to gadget and back and all that to do so. And not blocks of track uh, which are isolated and tell iTrain, for instance, that I've got where the train is and which I invested in when Hornby let go before. So, yeah, I'm a bit once bitten, twice shy. And as I said at the start of the show, 
I wait with bated breath as to the next moves to be announced by Hornby on the 9th. Simon Kohler did hint that Hornby was going in a different direction. And as yet, I'm still not sure what he meant by that. He wasn't going to put any more information out there on the plate, as it were. I also have a recording studio in the Mac Cave and Shiredale, the TT120 layout, is weaving through it all. And I've used Bluetooth devices to connect music gadgets together in the past with very, very poor results indeed. HMDCC is definitely 90% better than that, just as Apple's headphones, the Bluetooth type, are far better than the original Sony ones that were introduced years ago, which just lost connection all the time. But I do question, as I did back then with all that music gear, as I began to feel a bit groggy sat amongst it all when running all those keyboards, headphones, computers, tablets and phones together in one room for hours on end. So I got rid of it all. All this in mind, I'll be sticking with iTrain, old track fed DCC decoders that I've already bought and some Digikigis and the newer Yamaha block detection units to do this on my Mac going forward. Yeah, the old Bluetooth Loco, as the decoders are half the cost if they need adding to a double O, if they come equipped with the TT 121s, then fair enough. But having been bitten once in different ways, I will be proceeding with caution. And as I said, let's see what happens on the 9th. And I'll get back to you then. Number 16. If you're going with TT120, you're going to be guaranteed the latest modern production tooling on all the Hornby models, as are a lot of the double O ones that are coming through. Diecast uh, chassis, diecast bodies. Some are getting flickering fireboxes, but it's hit and miss depending on when the production went in. So some people have said, oh gosh, um, the 2MT should have flickering fireboxes, surely. But for me, I think the detail on them is fabulous. I love the K and W VR model preserved. I've just reviewed another link. Number 17, improved locomotive sounds. Definitely. Number 18, you're going to get the latest in sound quality from even the Sugar Cube speakers presently used, supplied with the HMDCC Hornby sound decoders and fitted to all TT120 locos out of the box, except the Class 08. Number 19, the first UK mass production of accurately scaled models. As we know, double O gauge models are slightly bigger and they've never gone back. So HO is scaled correctly to the track. Double O sits on HO track and they put the wheels slightly closer together, about 2.3 mil or something like that to get that. So TT120 is more accurately scaled. If you want that, then TT120 is the way to go. If you're not bothered. Number 20, models are cheaper than double O. Mm. though price is creeping since TT120 was introduced. Remember, we got at first reward points and then you got the TT120 discount for that membership. That membership is now free, but they've taken the 15%, was it? 10% discount off. At the end of the summer, the prices did go up a bit. They're still cheaper than double O, but that being said, Hornby are now releasing Railroad Plus. Swings and roundabouts, but mm, it's worth considering. I've also... I have my thoughts about buying second hand. You want to know where you're getting them from and who you're buying them from uh, because you can end up, as my mum would say again, with some right old tat. And I've done that as a kid. I ended up with pff, number 21. The decoders from home with the Bluetooth ones are half the price. If you go for these, either for TT or double O, there's an included speaker, various bass resonance chambers to fit nearly all spaces, the solder free speaker and stay alive plug and play system, which is all incorporated on the chip. So you just plug it in. It comes with all that in the box. Number 22, good selection of TT offerings from sellers on uh, eBay, smaller sellers. Number 23, great detailing throughout the TT120 range, in my opinion. I think it's fabulous. Second to none. And the modern double O gauge models are second to none too nowadays. Railroad or Railroad Plus, you're not going to get sprung buffers and you're not going to get lit cabs and all that. But that said, the detailing uh, and separate fitted pipe work and handrails and things like that. But the TT120 ones, woo! 
So number 24, TT120 fits in to tighter spaces. And yeah, we're here in Shiredale. And as I pick up my mouse, I'm going over onto um, iTrain and a picture of my layout within iTrain. And you can see these two dumbbells, as I call them, the various siding. That's where I'm sat right now. And this comes round into the windowsill area and I've added these signals, I've added the station and I've added some developments I'm going to be making this year already into the design. And this is all within the fictitious place of Shiredale. And that on my layout is just one smooth curve again. I've just drawn it a little bit different because of how it's set out to graphically show you. It's just a representation of where the train is and to make it look about right in my room. I walk in here sit here, uh, I can record music here, and I can have enough space for microphones, and of course iTrain's going to be up here, I've got another computer screen above here, which one I use for iTrain at the moment is debatable, but at the moment I've got it on the big wider screen. These dumbbells here are really what sets the cat amongst the pigeons when it comes to making model railways because you need to turn your locomotive round. Even an oval of track needs that gap there. This is the windowsill recess and remember I've got a twin track here and that is a number two radius going round. That length with a little bit of overhang at each end I would say wants to be 640 millimetres minimum. And this way with a little bit of an overhang, and I'm talking 10, 15, 20 millimetres, that wants to be 800. Remember, because you don't want your track going right up to the end of your board. It's a common mistake when you're designing model railways because you haven't taken that overhang into account. Number 25, as I said before, the Hornby freight wagons do have slight friction built into the wheels, making them less likely to bounce away when coupling, which is a great idea that some saw initially as an issue. I don't see it as an issue. The coaches are all free running and superbly painted and decorated as the wagons are. I have witnessed no glue marks at all. I've noticed glue marks on the double O stuff but not on the TT120. Number 26. Now, I'd say the track needs to be kept a little cleaner than double O, especially running any 060 wheel configuration models like the Class 08 Shunter, for instance. You need to have clean track. But once it's warmed up, the Class 08, it seems to run better. And of course, this has a Zimo sound decoder fitted, not a HM7000 Bluetooth decoder. If that makes a difference, I don't know. I've never run it DC. Number 27. Now the best track cleaner I've found is this by Woodland Scenics. And even though it states on the front that it is for N scale, H O scale, O scale, three rail, um, with a little bit of gentle persuasion, these pads here, you can see I've used it on double O, and on TT, I haven't got end scale. They do fit. They go onto the track. That wall there just breaks breaks down and accepts the track. I don't know whether they've updated this now, but it's called the Tidy Track by Woodland Scenics. It comes with various pads. It comes with some cleaning fluid. But I just use these mid pads at the moment. I've used this pad a little bit, felt pad, to get that extra polish if you want. But mainly, I just give it a good rub over, and this handle gets into your tunnel mouths, you know? But also, it just detaches. And nice thumb pegs there to stop your fingers slipping off, and then just go up and down your track like that, and it polishes it. It doesn't leave that horrible, nasty rubber residue that a normal track rubber will leave. This little peg on here can just unhook. It looks as though it hadn't clamped down right, but it's on a point where it just clicks in and holds. And then if you go back onto double O, you simply just swivel that round like so. That then works just the same for double O. I've got a big bottle of isopropyl alcohol, but this is probably made for the job, non-toxic. I don't really use that much unless you've got like oil residue or anything like that. These felt pads just go on the same way, yeah? 
and you can put it that way and that way for your TT. These ones are a bit more abrasive. I haven't really used these much, to be honest. And they, as you see, are brand new. When you offer them up, don't quite sit in. But again, if you use it, it will break. There it is. It's gone in now, look. It's broken down and it just sits in. And you can clean that to your heart's content. So I wouldn't have... Wouldn't take much notice of that. It does work in my experience. But again, that is my experience. I love this item, especially for getting down your girder bridges and into your tunnel mouths. I think it's fabulous. And then that just simply clicks back in. You can have it anywhere you want, really. And especially underneath any shelving or anything like that. And then, of course, we can swivel it like that and go sideways, round bends. I've got radius two curves and it's it's fitting in there fine. There we are. Woodland Scenics Track Tidy. It's not cheap. I think I got this for about 24 quid, to be honest. And I just picked it up as a matter of course. I was looking for something and I thought, this looks all right. You can buy the spare pads, obviously. And it's, it's been a godsend. I love that. I really love that and I can't recommend it enough. And I think it's a great gift for any model loco maniac like me. <laughs> <laughs> when you don't know what to buy them apart from socks or a wallet or a tie or a clock. Oh gosh. In a studio. And I've got a recording studio in here. Last thing you want is a ticking clock. And no, there aren't any self-track cleaning wagons available in the UK as yet for TT120. Number 28. Signals. I've used N-Scale. Um, and I've used N-Scale from DePaul. The uh, moving ones. And I've used Kite Lights and Gauge Master Train Tech Semaphore Signal Controller for this type of design. If anybody wants to know more about them, I looked into that quite deeply. Get in touch and I'll make a video about it. Someone had said on a Hornby forum, they do seem slightly overscaled. So I've just mounted mine just um, about five millimeter above the baseboard. And remember, I've got um, some track underlay as well and I think they look superb I think they look just right I took the gamble it's paid off um some four signal controllers do do two signals so I'm gonna get a home signal and a distant signal as well and maybe a couple more we'll have to see and some more from kite lights but I ordered a few things at once to make the post and back in so they're all to be fit but yeah engage and scale and um, they are fine Am I still as happy as a talking station clock pendulum with both double O and TT120? I certainly am. I have no regrets whatsoever. So which would I advise myself to get one year on if I could pick only one scale knowing what I know now? Well, that is a good question. Uh, if I was 8, 10, 12 again, then I'd definitely recommend... TT120. So here we are up in Loft House for a sneak peek at what, you may ask? One word, inclines. And as you can see here, we've got at least 25, 26 feet to climb up over a viaduct. Equally, you could say you're going to need at least 12 feet to climb that amount in TT120. And the models that are available at the moment, which are light, I would say, like the older Hornby models, i.e. the Mallard I've got on with TTS sound built in, they're light as well. And the Mallard does struggle a little bit when it's got a rake of coaches. I've noticed that if the track is a little bit out of level, especially with TT120 going round bends, the bogies tend to lift. Let's talk of the class 50s. There's the class 66s as well coming on tow. Class 43s coming out. Will they be any heavier? Talk has it that they will be. And if that's the case, then inclines are going to be a lot easier. Like the die cast models coming through in double O. But when you're in a tight space like a Coloft and you might need an incline like this, get the heaviest models, get the double O's or the die cast and go double O. Just the talk of traction tyres makes my stomach curdle. I don't know about yours. So that's not an option for me. And I would say it's even more important the smaller you go to have your track level. If it's slightly out, 
then you're going to get issues derailing, and especially with the longer locomotives, with the back pony wheels that can catch, I've noticed, if your rails are out of level at all. So when I built Loft House up here, plenty of thought went into the levelling side of it. We're going to visit up here again as we go into 2024. It's great up here, I love it. But it is a tight space and it needs inclines. So for TT120, in its present form, with the lighter bodies, I'd say give it a miss, especially with the Raker coaches. I definitely also recommend double O if you've got a big space or you've got a, you know, if you've got a nice warm garage that mum and dad or the wife or you've set yourself that space so you can make a huge model railway, double O's great because everything's there. Everything's on the market. But for someone starting out and building up slowly, I think TT120 is great. It's a great scale to get a hold of, especially when you think back to being about 12 and you've got a lot smaller hands. I remember getting hold of some TT120, um, well, not TT120, but the old Triang TT when I was a kid in a model shop. It was second hand and I loved the scale. I went, what's this? And he went, you can't get it, so I won't get it. I don't ever recommend box sets, but I definitely would recommend the Hornby Bluetooth, either in the Scotsman, it's not the Flying Scotsman, it's the Scotsman. And it comes with uh, a different train altogether, but it looks like a Flying Scotsman. It's just not got Flying Scotsman name on it. Um, but that with the Bluetooth decoder in or the Easterner set, they're doing two sets at the moment. They're both brilliant. And I would recommend those two box sets to anybody starting out. They'll link up with the app, Kids have got gadgets now, so you're not buying all those expensive controllers and transformers. It's all there in the box. Fair enough that the transformer is going to be a one milliamp or something like that output. Um, so you're not going to be able to run lots of trains on it, but it's there. It'll work and um, it run about two trains, I would imagine, without any problem. Well, I do hope that's helped you sort out some of the niggles and naggles when it comes to TT and double O. And if you had to choose one, which would I go with in the end? Well, I'd still have both. Maybe start out in TT, but I would have gone on to double O. I like the feel of double O, but I also like the accessibility of TT120. So that said, until next time, happy modeling. Subscribe, give us a thumbs up. Always post a comment. I read them all and I reply to everybody. It's nice to hear what you're up to, what you feel and what you think. Obviously, we all get those. Even to Pete Waterman on Making Tracks 3, he had a comment. One guy saying it's just a big oval going round and round. It's been a great year. Thanks to everybody that subscribed. And here's to 2024, eh? Woohoo! Here we come. Take care. Till the next time.